They say that school buses are one of the safest forms of transportation. Yet seat belts, which have been mandatory in cars and trucks for decades, don't exist on school buses. Two million kids across Canada are sitting unbuckled on buses every day. And when collisions happen, the consequences can be devastating. My daughter died in that crash. She was ejected from her seat and was killed instantly. It stands to reason seat belts would make kids safer. Notice that crash test dummies in seat belts stay in the bus. An unbelted dummy is violently ejected. So why aren't seat belts on school buses the law? A fifth estate investigation revealed that a single report by Transport Canada from the 1980s suggested belts wouldn't make things better. They even did a movie of it with the National Film Board. Buses with dummies were driven head on into a wall. But the study ignored side impacts and rollovers and never tested the kind of seatbelt you find today in most vehicles. It became what American officials called the most widely cited crash test of its time, trumpeted by bus manufacturers and school boards across North America. The fifth estate also discovered a more recent internal report by Transport Canada that contradicted its own previous findings, but it wasn't made public. Harvey Cashor produced this story for the fifth estate. Okay, Harvey, so what reaction has this story generated since it first aired? Well, since it aired, it's been all over the place. In the House of Commons, the minister was asked about it. School boards are asking about it. There's been statements from the school, uh, school bus uh, manufacturers, and parents are talking about it all over the country. The one person we didn't hear talking about it in the story was the federal minister of transport, Mark Garneau. As you mentioned, he did talk about it in the House of Commons the next day. Right. But it's the federal government that would implement this rule. So why wasn't he in your story? Well, one wonders, you know, was he waiting to see what impact the story was going to have before he answered questions? And I would uh, answer back to that. Well, if we're doing such a serious issue, possible injuries and deaths that might have been prevented, why would you wait to see what impact the story so might have had? did you ask him to be in the story? Yeah, we asked, uh, we asked for an uh, uh, on-camera interview with the minister. That was rejected. We asked several times. It got to the point where they wouldn't even respond to our emails at that point. We asked for a background briefing with the Transport Canada's you know, engineers and staff. That got rejected. Um, we asked repeatedly. Finally, we got, well, we'll take your questions by email and... Uh, and that's it. And we know what that means. We're going to study the questions and do some kind of response that's calculated. Which we see more and more from not just government, but corporations. They say, right. we're not going to sit down. We don't want accountability interviews, yeah. but send us the questions. We'll send you some answers. And it's, it's a little less fulfilling journalistically. Right. Having said that, though, you did have someone yeah. from the bureaucracy, a, mm -hmm. a woman who had co-authored a report right. who was in there. So how, how was that managed then? Well, eventually, I actually called that actual Transport Canada official and uh, on, got her voicemail and said, I know this has been rejected. I know you've been told not to talk to us. I'd like to ask for a second time. And then I also uh, emailed the same person. And I got a call back from the media office. And I thought, oh, no, they're going to get after me for making that phone call. <laughs> and they said, actually, no, we're thinking about it now. Now, what I would say that, you know, good for them they got that to happen. Why did it take to the process at the very end when we got that document when they knew how serious and how significant and, it was and, and frankly, as she makes clear, she was involved in the study, but she doesn't make policy. So Correct. the accountability doesn't really lie with her. That's a really good point. Like the accountability is who in Transport Canada made the decision. Still on the website, it says we have no evidence that seatbelts save lives. To this Even day, now. right now. I went on just an hour ago. To this day, they still say we have no evidence seatbelts save lives. Diana, they do have evidence, and we just revealed that new evidence. So our question is, why aren't people in, a, in accountability positions answering those questions? Okay, so I mean, the other flip side of this, of course, is that, yes, we elect people. We send them to Ottawa. We send them right. to the provinces. Uh, we do expect them mm -hmm. to answer questions, even the tough ones. But they get lots of requests. They are also there to do other things, to work on behalf of Canadians. They, they can't do everything. They're entitled to say no. Why, in your view... Should they have said yes to this interview? Well, this one really surprised me. I've done, you know, offshore tax stories. Maybe they can wait on those. This story we're talking about, if it's true in their own reports that injuries and deaths could have been prevented, wouldn't you want to deal with that immediately? Isn't this, this is not, you know, a discussion about what color do you want to paint the bus? This is, do you want to save lives or prevent injuries? And that's what we couldn't understand. Are you still asking for the interview? Yeah, and I, I, and I haven't given up. I, I believe. <laughs> I, mean, I, I won't give up. <laughs> I won't give up. And I believe he'll say yes next time. I hope he does. Thanks for talking about it. Thank you.